whatever political party you identify with, you are welcome here. Whatever color, culture, or creed you identify with, you are welcome here. If you are vaccinated or unvaccinated, you are welcome here. Now look around. Look around at these faces in this crowd. Take a good look around. This is America the Beautiful. And it's worth fighting for. You are worth fighting for. Your children are worth fighting for. Our freedom is worth fighting for. My name is Mickey Willis. I'm a father, a husband, and an investigative filmmaker. I was raised in California by a single mom who did her best to care for four children on her own. As a child of the welfare state, I witnessed firsthand what happens to the psyche and spirit of those who become dependent on government assistance. Had my mother known the difference between a hand up and a hand out, she may have avoided the trap that kept us living on the edge of poverty like so many people are today. Living in fear of losing her welfare assistance, mom remained single and lonely until the day she passed, at 58 years young. Her life was cut short by a combination of toxic cancer treatments and grief. Just 34 days before she passed, her first son, my brother, was killed by a drug called AZT. Hundreds of thousands of innocent people died as a result of that prescribed poison. The pusher of AZT was none other than Dr. Anthony Fauci. The reason that only one drug has been made available, AZT, because it's the only drug that has been shown to be safe and effective. Well, it's certainly nice to know that the future looks brighter. 30 years later, there he was again. Same script, same actors, same performance. These are safe and effective products. Knowing what that man had done in the 80s and 90s, I couldn't believe he was still in a position of such power. As the world descended into synchronized tyranny, I began to ask myself, how did they get everyone to go along with this? Oh, it feels so good. I know. Obsessed with finding the answer, I began studying every moment in recorded history where masses of people devolved into a state of self-destruction. Down that rabbit hole was where I discovered the work of G. Edward Griffin. Gentlemen, again let me say welcome to our home. Since the 1960s, Mr. Griffin has been warning the world of the communist plot to overtake America. Yes, I know, communism. Mr. Gorbachev, Tear down this wall. That thing we've all been told fell with the Berlin Wall. How do you measure such an astonishing moment in history? It was Napoleon who said, history is a lie agreed upon. Ironically, there's no evidence that Napoleon ever said that. As we're about to discover together, much of our history has been rewritten to serve an agenda that up until recently was invisible to the average person. Average, like this guy. Everyone's talking about the necessity for change right now, particularly here in the U.S. Over the past few months, as a filmmaker, I've had the honor of documenting the political revolution. That was me in 2016, the year of my political awakening. Come on, board the political revolution. I was touring with the Bernie Sanders campaign, creating media to help his grassroots movement grow. At that time, I knew very little about socialism and even less about democratic socialism. As it turned out, I wasn't the only one. So my Bernie bros, how do we redistribute wealth through taxation without expanding the powers of the federal government? Bernie Sanders! Fusion set in. I began turning my questions inward. 
Are they hypnotized? Am I hypnotized? That question, that one simple question activated some strange sort of faith healing. Suddenly, I could see. How did I not see this before? There were so many red flags. I'm well aware that whether you're here in person or through the medium of motion picture, that for most of you, it's not easy to fit meetings of this kind into your schedules. But the fact that you are here indicates that you do have an interest in the subject. So in order not to waste any of your time, let's dispense with the usual preliminaries and get right down to the business at hand. We're going to examine in quite a bit of detail the communist theory and practice of revolution particularly as applied to the United States. Now, this will not be something dreamed up out of thin air. This will be the strategy as taught by them and advocated by them in their own manuals, in their textbooks, and in their schools. The uh, new program of the Communist Party on this subject has this to say. The term socialism describes but the first stage of a new society that in its full development is called communism. Socialism is a transitional stage. Jim Carrey, everybody. <laughs> I went out today and bought me some freedom-friendly Nikes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's a salute to Colin Kaepernick, to Nike. Congratulations on right. your fantastic choice. Thank you so much. Well, it's I, good to be back it's in great to dystopian be... <laughs> America. <laughs> the Republicans are running with the word socialism. They're trying to They're say... They're trying to scare people. They're scare to people. Say it's communism. It's Venezuela, like, Trump says. You're, you know we're going to be living in Venezuela. I grew up in Canada. I'm here to tell you that this bullshit line that you get on all of the political shows from people is that it's a failure. The system is a failure in Canada. It is not a failure in Canada. I never waited for anything in my life. I chose my own doctors. My mother never paid for a prescription. It was fantastic. And I just got back from Vancouver, and I keep hearing this, like, Canadians are so nice. Canadians are so nice. They can be nice because they have health care. <laughs> because they have a government that cares about them. In Canada, the authorities say it's now a state of emergency. It's Swept through Canada's capital. Today, police in Ottawa used batons and pepper spray. You just trampled that lady. Look what you did to her! Medical wait times in this country are longer than ever. The cost of living just keeps climbing. There's a socialist coup unfolding in Canada, and we taxpayers are funding it. In the recent years, a lot of Canadians have been watching their once well-regarded country become what some are even calling tyrannical. A country previously hailed as the most free and democratic in the world. Now, the People's World, the official West Coast newspaper of the Communist Party, ran this rather interesting editorial. What is needed now is an effort that begins to approximate the magnitude of the problem. As a minimum, such a program should demand massive emergency action by the federal government. The federal government has invoked the Emergencies Act. As of today, a bank or other financial service provider will be able to immediately freeze or suspend an account without a court order. If you are involved in this protest, we will actively look to identify you and follow up with financial sanctions and criminal charges. Banks have already started to freeze the accounts of people involved in the protest. Please get out. Immediately get out. Intimidating people in a church during the Passover. Unbelievable. Growing up under communist dictatorships, I have been warning Canadians that that's what's coming. I could smell it. I could see it at every corner. We will not put up with this anymore. We are fighting back. Protests, public protests, are an important part of making sure we're getting messages out there. Uh, but using protests to demand uh, changes to public policy 
um, is something that, that I think is, is, is worrisome. Okay. So here we have the Prime Minister of Canada saying that, yes, we have a highly functioning democracy and they have the right and freedom to protest. However, if those protests are used to demand change in government policy, then no. The small fringe minority are, who are uh, holding unacceptable uh, views uh, that they're expressing. do not represent the views of Canadians who know that following the science and stepping up to protect each other is the best way to continue to ensure our freedoms, our rights, our values as a country. Liberal Prime Minister Justin Trudeau claims to be following the science, but Trudeau's science often comes in the form of this bizarre authoritarian technocracy. I think that Justin Trudeau stepped on the landmine when he weaponized the banking system in Canada against the truckers. Those peaceful trucker protests, you know, their most violent act was honking their horns. And in retaliation, they had their access to their bank accounts, and anybody that supported them in any way had their access to bank accounts eliminated. And at that moment in time, we all came to realize what was really going down. Even with Sun TV watching for any slip, he was asked which country he most admired and referred to China. The level of admiration I actually have for China, um, because they're, you know, basic dictatorship is allowing them. I applaud China for stepping up, excuse me, I applaud Canada. I'm, you can tell what I'm thinking. <laughs> A prime minister who openly admires the Chinese basic dictatorship who tramples on fundamental rights by persecuting and criminalizing his own citizens as terrorists just because they dared to stand up to his perverted concept of democracy should not be allowed to speak in this house at all. Mr. Trudeau, please spare us your presence. Thank you. Canadians know where I stand. This is a moment for responsible leaders to think carefully about where they stand and who they stand with. While Justin Trudeau makes a compelling case study, he is not the only dictator on the rise. Under the new rules provided by the COVID-19 emergency, many other elected leaders were empowered to show their true colors. Interesting how they all marched in perfect lockstep while chanting the same slogans. This pandemic has provided an opportunity. Here we are now with an economy in crisis, but with an incredible opportunity. It's certainly a major crisis, but it also offers us a unique opportunity. Unprecedented opportunity to rethink and reset. The great opportunity for reset. Opportunity for us to reset. For a reset. It's almost as if they all attended the same school of thought and studied under the same professor. Some people would say this revolution is characterized by the fight of robots against human beings. And we will win this fight. Professor Klaus Schwab was born in 1938 in Ravensburg, Germany, where Nazi crimes against humanity were committed. His father, Eugene Wilhelm Schwab, was the managing director of Escher Weiss Ravensburg a company that used slave labor to manufacture weapons of war for the Third Reich. While Klaus's father was at the helm, the Nazi party awarded Escher Weiss Ravensburg the title of National Socialist Model Company. Years later, Klaus Schwab joined the board of directors at Escher Weiss Ravensburg, where he played a key role in the development of South Africa's nuclear weapons program during the darkest years of the racist apartheid regime. Today, Klaus Schwab is the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. If you'd like to meet the people who are supposed to repair the state of the world, or give a piece of your mind to the bankers who helped get us into this mess, we can tell you where to find a lot of them. The World Economic Forum. Founded in 1971, 
the World Economic Forum is an international private organization which receives billions of tax-free dollars from its members and their global enterprises. Every year, the WEF brings together its members with world leaders, big pharma executives, tech titans, Hollywood celebrities, media personalities, and internet influencers to meet in the secluded mountains of Davos, Switzerland. It is a tiny town folded into the Swiss Alps, a village where you could bump into Bill Clinton, Bill Gates, the head of Google, and the Queen of Jordan, all in one place. A lot of reporters cover the forum, but few get inside. It turns out there are two Davoses, one you see and one you don't. After hours, there are hundreds of private parties where deals are done. People who can't be seen together in public can meet here. Your Royal Highnesses, Excellencies, distinguished heads of state and government, the future is built by us, by a powerful community as you here in this room. Klaus Schwab, the founder of the WEF, is particularly upfront and even proud of his ability to shape and influence world politics. I created the community of global shapers as a means, as a force to shape our common future. And of course, their Global Young Leaders program is a grooming ground so that when they ultimately infiltrate cabinets, we penetrate the cabinets, they will likely tend to govern a certain way. Nobody will be safe if not everybody is vaccinated. The names and the countries he mentioned ended up being some of the most dystopian and authoritative during this pandemic. Names like Ms. Merkel, uh, Vladimir Putin, and so on. Other names? Just Cinda Ardern, Sebastian Kurz, Mauricio McCree, Mark Zuckerberg, Jack Ma, Gavin Newsom, Stephane Bancel, Chelsea Clinton, Leonardo DiCaprio, Sanjay Gupta, Dr. Leanna Wen, Alexander and Jonathan Soros, George Soros' sons, and several of the Rothschilds. And of course... Now who could represent such a world better than you, Prime Minister? In 2014, Klaus Schwab called for the Great Reset. We need a Great Reset. Which he positioned as the solution to the world's most urgent issues. The dark reality of Schwab's agenda is detailed in his best-selling book, COVID-19, The Great Reset. His in-game mission is to replace independent governance with a top-down controlled, one world government and a central bank controlled digital currency. When they say, you'll be happy. What they mean is, you'll be enslaved. That's why they're talking about a Great Reset. That's why they're talking about introducing this quasi-communist, quasi-socialist agenda. They know we've run the course where we cannot continue down the path of the ever-increasing indebtedness because we have a generation that quite literally cannot afford to buy a house. Millions of Americans are priced out of buying a home. And so it's easy to tell that generation, we're gonna forgive your college debt. Student debt relief. And set your expectations lower. You're gonna rent forever. We're gonna celebrate the tiny house movement. We're gonna do all of these things which sound cool because they're shaping our narrative so that we become capable of expecting less. What we need to do is not expect less. We need to remove inefficiencies so we can experience more. And that's the subtle distinction that the Great Reset is missing. Like most globalists, Schwab regards communist China as a shining model of how he intends to transform the world. We now welcome His Excellency Xi Jinping. China has made significant economic and social achievements under your leadership. Chinese influence on global affairs is growing. The founder of the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, says that this is what motivated the group this year to invite President Xi Jinping to deliver the keynote address in Davos. Schwab said Xi's presence was a sign of the shift from a unipolar world dominated by the United States to a more multipolar system in which rising powers like China will have a step up and play a bigger role. I think it's um, a role model for many countries. But um, we have to go one step further. It's a systemic transformation of the world. Artificial intelligence, the metaverse, 
synthetic biology, our life in 10 years from now will be completely different and who masters those technologies will be the master of the world. Similar to his protege, Justin Trudeau, Klaus Schwab makes a fascinating case study. Yet he too is merely the master of his own world, Economic Forum. Science is replacing evolution by natural selection with evolution by intelligent design. Not the intelligent design of some god above the clouds, but our intelligent design and the intelligent design of our clouds the IBM cloud, the Microsoft cloud, these are the new driving forces of evolution. Today, we have the technology to hack human beings on a massive scale. And by this, I mean that if you have enough data and you have enough computing power, you can understand people better than they understand themselves. And then you can manipulate them in ways which were previously impossible. You know, the, the whole idea that humans have this soul or spirit and they have free will, that's over. Now, how exactly will the future masters of the planet look like? This will be decided by the people who own the data. Foreign powers can collect, store, and exploit biometric information from COVID tests. U.S. intelligence officials tell CBS News that China is trying to collect Americans' DNA in hopes of controlling the future of healthcare. China's test kits are a tool to help China compile genetic data. The Chinese aren't the only ones exploring this technology. The U.S. is working on it as well. The White House is ramping up its COVID response, announcing Americans can once again get free COVID test kits as concerns are growing over a rare... Data is the most important asset in the world. Those who control the data control the future, not just of humanity, but the future of life itself. Everywhere she goes, Ouyang Haoyu is followed. What she buys, how she behaves, is tracked and scored to show how responsible and trustworthy she is. It's called the social credit system. A person's reputation is scored on a scale of 350 to 950. It's big data meets big brother, expanding how the government monitors, understands, and ultimately controls its 1.4 billion citizens. A good score brings benefits, but people with low scores lose rights. The cinema names and shames people considered untrustworthy, plastering their details, even their addresses across big screens. And information collectors are paid to report on their neighbors. The Supreme Court has created a blacklist for so-called bad citizens. Among them is this journalist he got a little too close to uncovering corruption among high-profile party members. He was blacklisted. He only realized when he tried to buy a train ticket. Once you're blacklisted, you can no longer get a bank loan, start a business, buy an apartment, or even send your children to a private school. By using the mechanism of social credit, we'll be able to establish a blacklist of people. These punishments will serve as a whip to rebuild moral values. And few here are willing to criticize it, something that may pose a risk itself for a bad score and the life that comes with it. It may seem scary, but it's just like that here. We're used to it, and anyway, we don't have a choice. China wants obedient citizens. Criticism or resistance among the population is virtually non-existent. This woman's door was kicked in by police when she refused to go to quarantine. Now, these videos show rows of metal containers which are being used to house COVID-19 patients. Some of them have complained that very little food is left for them in the freezing metal boxes. Chinese government officials now installing fences in Shanghai, blocking people from leaving their homes. For some, Shanghai feels like the world's largest prison. How does a handful of autocrats gain total control? over a population of 1.4 billion. I have two master degrees, one in clinical psychology, one in statistics. And at the beginning of the crisis, I started to study the statistics a little bit. 
the initial mathematical models and the initial statistics all had dramatically overrated the dangerousness of the virus. That was the moment when I started to, to think how it was possible that an entire society and an entire population was in the grip of a narrative which in, in many respects was blatantly wrong. After a few months it became clear to me that the only mechanism that could explain what was happening in society was what is usually referred to as mass formation. Mass formation is identical to hypnosis. And this term refers to a, a specific kind of group formation, which has very special characteristic effects at the level of individual mental functioning. And one of these effects is that an individual that is in the grip of mass formation typically lose every capacity to take a critical distance from what they believe in, from what the group believes in. You would think it would be people with lower IQs that would be more susceptible to this, but it seems to be the other way around. Are you seeing this? I have seen this. And it does seem to be predicted by educational status and IQ. We look to be verified for our belief system, right? And so a doctor goes to the CDC. The CDC says this is true, it must be true. I'm staying in that zone. It's actually people outside of the system go, well, I, I want to challenge the CDC here for a second. Where's this study come from? Where's it, you know, and that's what I do. All of these people were kept out of the all conversation. I, all I can comment And you were there. wanting me to sign onto a, a, a social contract where the scientific method isn't being used. I'm not interested in medical pedigree. I'm interested in medical consensus. People who are highly intelligent tend to go and get a lot of degrees. Those people have spent so many years in institutions to get those degrees that they have developed a trust and confidence in not only the educational institutions, but those that support them, which are largely government bodies. And so they start from the place of, if it's told by the university, by the government, it's probably going to be true. What I've learned about science is that it's really imagined they're looking at like a fragment of the world, and it's all they see. It's all they're looking at. The world, they don't see the world. So I think that there's a disconnect between people who are smart and have lots of degrees with actual reality, with the lived experience of nature, of life, that you don't see with people who are actually working with their hands outdoors all of the time. A mass formation typically emerges in a society when very specific conditions are met. First and for all, the most central condition is a major part of the population needs to feel lonely. Doctors say the very rules to keep people safe from the virus are doing great damage when it comes to anxiety, depression, and even suicide. And now everyone is suffering, but children are particularly ill. The real pandemic here is the psychological warfare that's being waged on every single human being. See, if you take a human being and you put them in a chronic fear state, and you couple that with human isolation, what happens, they psychologically decompensate and live in such emotional pain that they will gravitate in an irrational way to anything that you promise them will alleviate that pain. Once people feel disconnected from their environment, they will typically start to experience a lack of meaning making in life. And under these conditions, if a narrative is distributed through the mass media, indicating an object of anxiety, and the strategy to deal with this object of anxiety, they suddenly, punk, connect to one small object of fear, for instance, the coronavirus, and afterwards, people don't feel lonely anymore. They feel connected again. Let me hear it if you've had the Pfizer vaccine. Let me hear it for Moderna. AstraZeneca. Let's hear it for the anti-vaxxers. The new kind of social bond is highly problematic, just because the connections between the individuals even deteriorate more, and the bond between the individual and the collective becomes stronger and stronger and stronger, which makes them willing to sacrifice everything for the collective. Its health, its wealth, the future of its children, everything. Something else that is really characteristic of individuals in mass formation is that they become radically intolerant for dissonant voices. 
the people who are not getting vaccines, it's time to start shaming them. What else? Or leave them behind. Vaccinated person having a heart attack? Yes, come right on in. We'll take care of you. Unvaccinated guy, rest in peace, Wheezy. <laughs> We have to stop coddling the morons who will not get the shot. Get away from Put me. Put it on. Does it bother anybody else that she doesn't have to wear a mask that we all do? When are we going to stop putting up with the idiots in this country? You're a schmuck for not wearing a mask. And just say it's mandatory to get vaccinated. Screw your freedom. People who do not go along with the masses are stigmatized. And in the end, the masses are inclined to destroy the people who do not go along with them. And. They do so as if it is an ethical duty to do so. Getting good people to do bad things, harmful things, while thinking they're good things, it's a dangerous place to be because it looks great. Yeah. You feel great while you're being used. They will sacrifice themselves and they see it as a virtue because it demonstrates their complete obedience to the cult, to the group, to perform ritualistic behavior, which causes them harm. One of the most clear illustrations of this was when the leaders of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union were sentenced to death, often tortured to death. They did not object. They said things like, if this helps the Communist Party, it's my pleasure to do it. That's something that was observed in all major examples of mass formation in history. I was born in communist China two years before Mao started his uh, cultural revolution. So we had to be indoctrinated and the chanting slogans and holding Chairman Mao's little red books to say, long live Chairman Mao, long live Communist Party. Inspired by Soviet Union dictators, Vladimir Lenin and Joseph Stalin, China's communist leader, Mao Zedong, borrowed from the playbook of the Russian Revolution. To fight anti-communist forces, Lenin organized a military branch of his Communist Party, known as the Red Army. Following suit, Mao branded his army the Red Guards. However, Mao's soldiers were not enlisted from his military. His Red Guards were made up of high school and university students. So he used young people to start cultural revolution, to top down statues, burning old buildings, and demonize all religions going after all dissident voices and to turn all the Chinese against each other, family turn on each other, neighbors turn on each other. Chairman Mao, as he was known, was deeply influenced by Lenin's ideas on Marxism and revolution and often praised Stalin as a great leader. He started his Great Leap Forward campaign in the 50s and killed two million landlord owners. 40 million to 60 million people estimated starving to death. The people were trading their children's dead bodies to eat, to survive. Cannibalism was everywhere. Through war, torture, execution, and famine, Chairman Mao caused the death of 80 million innocent people, making him the deadliest dictator of all time. China shaved the heads of women put them all in unattractive asexual clothes, did the same thing for the men. This technique has been used in the 20th century by every totalitarian regime. The Mao wanted to create a genderless society. That's why girls like me could not wear beautiful clothes and could not do makeup. We have to just look like boys, unisex, no gender. They asexualize the population so that there's no more desire, no more bipolarity of male and female. Everybody looks like an automaton. And then what do they do? Rather than turning towards one another, they turn towards the state. So the only thing left for me, a child to believe in, is communism. And the Mao was the new god.
Now, in China, the government is not only cracking down on Muslims, but on other religions as well, as it pushes to assert communist ideology. Here's something else that is banned in China, Falun Gong, a religious movement that emphasizes on spiritual enlightenment and cultivation of virtue. 5,000-year-old Chinese civilization were founded on faith. Communist regime is atheist. So any philosophies which encourage people to believe God, believe good things, is something they don't like. I decided to escape China after serious persecution I have experienced. Under this the pretext of COVID-19 coronavirus, the Chinese Communist Party has intensified its persecution. We were arrested several times and detained in various detention and brainwashing centers. Over the past few years, a vast network of camps has been built across Xinjiang. A series of classified bulletins show how easy it is to be singled out by the Chinese government for education and training. The U.S. Defense Department says as many as three million are being forcibly detained in re-education and forced labor camps. China calls them thought transformation camps built to prevent extremism from spreading, but reports indicate they're more like prisons. When I was detained in detention center, I was handcuffed and hung over a radiator pipe with my toes barely touching the ground. And I was hung over there for three days. The CCP guards brought four male detainees into my cell and began one of the worst experience of torture. And on the brink of death, I realized I could do nothing but turn to my belief. So I pray to be saved. Hmm. Moments later, one of the four male detainees suddenly fainted on the floor, which interrupted the torture. I left China because my parents were heavily persecuted for their practice of Falun Gong. From age one to age five, my grandparents were taking care of me because um, my parents, they were always inside some dark cells being tortured. My first clear memory of my mother um, I was brought to a brainwashing center and saw her being tied up to a chair with like people behind her, guarding her. And she had a very thick plastic tube inserted into her nose and she was being force fed at the time. She just looked like she was in so much pain. And I was, at, I was five at the time, that was, it's just very traumatizing. My school principal actually came to me several times and told me not to be a part of my parents and to report any activity that my parents would do. They're instilling all the lies and hatred into the younger generation. The young people are used today to do the American Cultural Revolution, to turn the kids basically not to trust their parents anymore. And say, oh, my parents don't understand me. I'm confused. I need to turn to my teachers, turn to other authority figures. Look at the Mao's Cultural Revolution to say how many similarities are there.
happy. You are happy with what was happening in the USSR no, we're between not. 1917. We make a critique of it. That's why we're Maoists. We make a critique of it in order to improve socialism the next time it comes around and throws people like your ass into a labor camp. Yesterday, I asked ChatGPT, are there any similarities between today's woke revolution and Chairman Mao's cultural revolution of the 1960s? And it wrote back, how long do you have? We recognize that government is absolutely necessary for an orderly society. But following the dictum that government, like fire, is both beneficial and dangerous, we believe in the concept of limited government. And we believe that the constitutional republic created by our founding fathers is the best form of limited government that has yet been devised by man. A republic is a limited democracy. It's a form of government based upon the principle of limited majority rule. Limited so that the minority, even a minority of one, can be protected against the whims and passions of the majority. Now, democracy is a form of government based upon the principle of majority rule. It's easy to understand, easy to sell to the masses, and I might add, deadly. The fathers of philosophy, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, were all staunch critics of democracy. History's greatest minds all observed that even a well-intended democracy can breed deception, division, and ultimately, total control by the state. Aristotle wrote that democracy is not just the rule of the majority. Democracy is a system in which uh, the majority is in charge, respecting the basic elementary rights and principles of minorities. If not, democracy becomes a tyranny of the majority. Socrates himself became a victim of this very process. He was sentenced to death by a majority vote for protesting the rights and protections of the minority. This country was founded on the principle that the individual is sovereign over the institution of government. And it's about a philosophy of governance that says that you are a free individual, or a philosophy of governance that says you're serf and you're subject. We have inalienable rights just by virtue of being human. And so their primary responsibility as the government is to protect those rights. These aren't rules to govern me, they're rules to govern the government. Like what you know, what you are and are not allowed to do to me. We are a constitutional republic with a representative democracy, so people do vote, but we have a separation of powers. So if you majority vote to eat you for lunch, the Supreme Court can say, no, you cannot. And how do you protect the minority from the majority? You write down a set of rules on a piece of paper. You say, this we can do, that we cannot. At the top of the paper, you write the word Constitution. And then everyone agrees to follow the rules no matter what the temptation. And when you're finished, you've created a constitutional republic. It was Thomas Jefferson who said, the republic is the only form of government which is not eternally at open or secret war with the rights of mankind. Now we hear a lot of talk today about right-wingers, left-wingers, extremists, and moderates. The political spectrum concept, if it has any meaning at all, is a measurement scale showing all the variations in government. Now, the extremists at the zero end would be those who advocate no government at all, the anarchists. The extremists at the other end would be those who advocate total government. And who are they? Well, the communists, of course. But also the Nazis, the fascists, no matter what they may call themselves, if they advocate total government control over the people. They are all, by definition, totalitarians. The debate is not between conservatives and liberals. It goes back in history long before those words were ever invented. The opposing points of view properly are identified as individualism versus collectivism. The individualist believes that the rights of the individual must not be obliterated by the desires of the collective or the group. The collectivist, on the other hand, believes that the group is more important than the single person within it, and that the individual must be sacrificed if necessary for the greater good of the greater number. 
The individualists believe that every man has a personal and direct responsibility to provide first for himself, next for his family, and then for those outside his family who may be in need. The collectivist, on the other hand, declares that the individual is not personally responsible for charity, for raising his own children, providing for his aging parents, or even providing for himself, for that matter. This is a group function of the state, of government itself. Everything we talk about socialism, communism, globalism, and Nazism, guess what? It's all collective society. Collectivism on an international level is essentially known as globalism, which is often promoted as a framework for unity and sustainability. Under the guise of philanthropy, the leaders of the globalist movement leverage every possible crisis to advance their plan to replace national sovereignty with a one-world government. We are confronted with so many crises simultaneously. What does it need to master the future? It is the globalists who are behind the destructive new methods of control, like ESG, the acronym for Environmental Social Governance. Similar to China's social credit score, ESG is a ranking system that tracks a company or country's carbon footprint, as well as its commitment to diversity and inclusion. A low ESG score can lead to severe consequences, including reputational damage, legal and regulatory actions, and loss of investors and bank credit lines. Within the last decade, numerous nations and thousands of major brands have been coerced to adapt to the ESG program. And today, many of them are paying the price. In 2018, the World Economic Forum published an article on its website entitled, How We Will Make Sri Lanka Rich by 2025. That article was removed once it became known that food prices in Sri Lanka had nearly doubled and that millions of their citizens were facing starvation. Now what caused this? Farmers protested and asked the government to work with them on slowly improving farming practices to be more environmentally friendly rather than implementing harsh bans. But the government was more interested in maintaining a high ESG score with its creditors like BlackRock. As a result, food production dropped drastically, with farmers expecting crop losses of 85%. The country had to begin spending money on importing food when it was previously self-sufficient. Sri Lanka is a cautionary tale. What's happening there could be a foreshadowing of what's in store for us if we don't take heed and learn some lessons. The Dutch government was one of the first to sign on to the ESG system. Dutch farmers pleaded that the rush to adapt to extreme new regulations would result in the destruction of the country's food supply. The Netherlands is the second largest agriculture exporter in the world, earning the title of the tiny country that feeds the world. A collapse of their system could trigger a global food crisis. Yet, the Netherlands prime minister continued to persecute Dutch farmers until they were forced to revolt. Where do you find still such a prime minister in the world? You find it in the Netherlands, and it's Mark Rutte. And remember too, the Netherlands is the pilot program of the World Food Hubs, and the World Economic Forum has assigned to the Netherlands what they call this global secretariat, using ironically a communist term for it. Klaus Schwab's golden pinup boy, Prime Minister Mark Rutte, is busy fulfilling the agenda of the World Economic Forum's Great Reset by turfing farmers off their own land. Perhaps the most important lesson I've learned in my years as Prime Minister of one of the world's most outward-looking trading countries is that national interests are often best served by international cooperation. Schwab has sold this idea because they're up against the wall. Okay, you have all these governments that are basically broke. So what will happen is if they defaulted, then all the people have lost their pensions, they've counted on it, and they're going to be storming their palaces with pitchforks. Schwab has sold the idea that, well, we go towards Marxism and you can still retain power. None of these net zero climate schemes work without massively disrupting or even destroying the lives of the little people. 
If you think about what created wealthy people wealthy throughout the many years of our human history, it was the ownership of land. And you have governments right now that are looking to take ownership of real estate, and it's happening everywhere. And you have this movement of individuals kind of going like, hey, like people should never profit off of real estate. And unfortunately, that ideology is what the government is using to take control. If we look at data from 2001 to 2015, there is a slow and steady trend towards more corporations owning single family homes, apartments, office spaces, and less and less individuals actually owning real estate. Blackstone Group actually recently raised a record of $50 billion to take homes from American families. During the pandemic, when all people were ordered to lock down indoors, why did governments around the world make exceptions for mass protests? We've all heard the term fire sale. In this case, it's not a metaphor. When a community is damaged by protests, the value of local properties plummet. Investors then gobble up the devalued real estate for pennies on the dollar. In many cases, the leaders of the decimated communities receive kickbacks for allowing this transfer of wealth. Big companies and investment firms swooping in and buying up some of the only affordable homes in your neighborhood. The more you have individuals not own their own home, the more you have individuals not financially independent, creates more dependence on big financial corporations that profit off of mass people. So we are going towards a world where the people are owning nothing. I always say, like, if we, if we don't own anything, well, who does? Bill Gates, business magnate, software developer, philanthropist, nation's largest farmland owner. Gates owns nearly 270,000. It's a reinstitution of Marxism where, you know, communism owned all the property. In his Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx wrote, the theory of communism may be summed up in a single sentence, abolition of private property. Karl Marx was a German philosopher and social theorist who lived in the 1800s. He is the co-author of the Communist Manifesto, which has been referred to as the Bible of Communism. His theories of class conflict and dialectical materialism were instrumental in shaping socialist and communist movements worldwide. Joseph Stalin, Vladimir Lenin, Leon Trotsky, Mao Zedong, Che Guevara, Fidel Castro, Kim Jong-un, Hugo Chavez, Nicolas Maduro, and many other communist revolutionaries have cited Marxism as the foundation of their political ideologies. Marx rejected all concepts of God, as well as the traditional family. According to members of his own family, Marx was emotionally, verbally, and physically abusive. His wife, Jenny, was plagued by depression, which was compounded by Carl's adulterous impulses and his inability to provide for his children. Despite his privileged upbringing and formal education, Karl Marx was often unwilling to work and instead relied on the financial support of friends and family. In 1943, the following directive was issued from party headquarters to all communists in the United States. It read, when certain obstructionists become too irritating, label them as fascist or Nazi or anti-Semitic. In the public mind, constantly associate those who oppose us with those names which already have a bad smell. The association will, after enough repetition, become fact in the public mind. The Founding Fathers were racist, misogynist, fascist, 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 fascist political party, radicals on the far right, anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic, xenophobic, transphobic, Uncle Tom's white supremacist, domestic terrorist, neo-Nazi organizer, Nazis, you are an anti-vaxxer, anti-vaxxers, racist, 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 a racist. Name calling is their number one bullying tactic, and they apply it unremittingly to anyone who questions their dogma or says something they find unacceptable or offensive. <laughs> As early as 1928, the communists declared that the racial differences among our people constituted the weakest and most vulnerable point in our social fabric. By constantly probing and straining at this one spot, they calculated that eventually the cloth could be torn apart and that Americans could be divided, weakened, and perhaps even set against each other in open combat. They said in no unmistakable terms that the Negro people, because of their social status and their predominant working class composition, offered greater revolutionary possibilities than any other cross-section of the population. How do we get out of this mess? Revolution, nothing 
The communists call not only for extensive chaos within the cities, the plan is for raging fires from one city to the next. The average American, they say, soft and decadent, when he sees billows of black smoke rising from one horizon to the other, when at night the only light he has to see by is the flickering red from flames leaping into the sky, he'll become paralyzed with fear and panic and do nothing to interfere with the guerrilla bands as they strike at the community's power centers. To justify violence, they have to be able to claim that they're liberating people. And if people are to be liberated, then it's necessary to go through the motions, at least, of pretending that they have a right to form a nation of their own. The Communist Party called for their liberation to break away from the United States and to set up their own nation within our borders. Activists now control a barricaded area. It's been called an autonomous zone. They want it to be free of capitalism, state authority, and police. To take the United States, all of the United States, it'll be necessary, they say, to involve white people as well as black, and in general, to escalate their revolution in America from race war to class war. Now, when they talk about pressure from above, they mean using their people and their influence within the very government marked for takeover to bring forward official recommendations for legislation. The recommendations, of course, are offered supposedly as solutions to national problems, but when passed into law, their only real effect is to vastly increase the power of government and to move the country that much closer toward the ultimate goal. The pressure from below, then, involves using their influence over the various mass membership organizations of the country to create the appearance of great popular support for these recommendations. Of course, the members of those organizations must never suspect that they're being used to promote the communist program. Now, the silent majority, the average person, is caught right in the middle. He looks above and sees highly respected spokesmen for government calling for socialist legislation. He looks below and sees mobs of demonstrators shouting for the same thing. He says to himself, has everyone gone crazy or is it me? Now, he's still in the majority, of course, but he doesn't know it. He thinks he's helplessly outnumbered, and he bows to what he thinks is the democratic will of the majority. Here's an interesting thing I've noticed, is even with a lot of these ideologies, right, with what people call these days, you know, woke, if people were these horrible, awful, bigoted, racist, xenophobic, white, but like, it wouldn't even work. The only reason it even works is because people are so compassionate that they, oh, like, I want to make sure I use the right words and I say the right phrases. So you're, you're actually weaponizing the fact that people are decent people and you're taking that compassion and you're targeting it at, oh, this is the group of people who you should be angry at. They weaponized human compassion. We mustn't kid ourselves into thinking that the communists have placed their agitators only into the black communities. They're working both sides of the street. They want hatred, violence, and bloodshed between the races, and they don't care how they get it or whom they use, even children if necessary. My young comrades. Hi. This is my way of figuring out if you've been tainted by the patriarchy. Patriarchy? Oh! <laughs> this looks creepy. It looks creepy. And why? There's just like this thing about white people that just makes me be like. <laughs> oh, looks like Donnie got a full cookie. Because he's a white man. Say it with me. Structural racism. Yeah! You may have wondered why the Communist Party has been a staunch supporter of the drive to place a black studies curriculum into our high schools and colleges. The reason becomes obvious the minute you take a look at the textbooks and the study guides. Schools are now radicalizing our kids. I mean, this is the volume of the book from uh, Critical Race Theory, and it literally says here, whiteness is a bad deal, and it has a symbol of Satan. You gonna deliberately teach kids this white kid right here got it better than you because he white? You gonna purposely tell a white kid, oh, the black people are all down to suppress. 
How do I have two medical degrees if I'm sitting here oppressed? Not only is it in the schools, but it's in the workplace, it's throughout society, it's destroying this country. If this continues, we will look back and be responsible for the dismantling of the greatest country in the world by reverting to teaching hate and that race is a determining factor on where your destiny lies. Thank you. Sarasota School Board Chairwoman, what has been the worst of what you've had to deal with in terms of community or parental reaction? Uh, you know, the, the, the calling of names, you know, the, you know, tyrant, Marxist, communist, and they want to move kids over to charter schools and private schools um, without the oversight of the state. And that's wrong. Education authorities in the United States are asking the government to use anti-terror laws and involve the FBI against parents who protest against the way their children are being taught. It identifies no fewer than 13 possible federal crimes, including making annoying phone calls. How about this one? They could be prosecuted for using the internet in a way that might cause emotional distress. Over the weekend, Democrats voted to ban gendered language in House rules. And that means no more terms like father or mother. Is the administration's official policy to replace the term woman with birthing people? Black birthing people. Black birthing people. Black and indigenous birthing people. Uh, you shifted from, in places, from using the term mother to birthing people. Again, if, we, if we're trying to be precise in, in the language that's used, mom's a pretty good word. I'm not a birth person. I'm a mother. Can you provide a definition for the word woman? Can I provide a definition? Mm -hmm. no. Yeah. I can't. You can't? Mm, not in okay. this context. So I'm not a biologist. The meaning of the word woman is so unclear and controversial that you can't give me a definition. Do you believe then that men can become pregnant and have abortions? Yes. Literally everything that was fought for for women's rights is going straight down the drain. This environment that has been created and corrupted and manipulated does not respect women, does not respect children, does not respect men. It cares nothing for family. So that's why they have to attack mother and remove father because she's gonna protect that child, he's gonna protect that woman, and they both are gonna protect society. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your service. When you talk about a parent-child relationship, you're talking about something primal that is in the heart of the liberal, not the Marxist, that's in the heart of the person who's conservative. And they're pushing the boundaries on something that they cannot control. Washington state is on track to lawfully take gender dysphoric children away from parents who oppose transitioning treatment. That is against the Constitution. The only time a parent loses their rights is if there's an extreme circumstance. It's severing the bond between the parent and the child. What they're doing is they're dividing families to take control of the children. The biggest defense against communism is the nuclear family. In chapter two of his Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx wrote, abolition of the family. The bourgeois family will vanish as a matter of course. We're here today to represent the millions of black Americans who disagree with the Black Lives Matter movement. If you go to Black Lives Matter website, it says that we disrupt the nuclear family. That's my wife. This is our four children. Why would you disrupt the nuclear family? Because the real objective is to remove the family as a possible alternate source of guidance and support. All totalitarian regimes strive to destroy the close-knit family in order to remove any loyalties that might be higher than to the state itself. I have seen over the years in my practice a steady decline in the expression of healthy masculinity and healthy femininity. The separation between the male and the female is almost complete now, and it's due specifically to the ongoing attacks against masculinity and the degradation of femininity. And if our family structure is lost in the next generation, what do we have left? We're just a bunch of listless individuals living our lives out virtually behind a computer screen and following the orders of the government. Maybe it's because I came in the movement at 17 and a half, so I have like just a knack for knowing how to organize young people. 
I was at the art publications table today and I was speaking to this young person and he grabbed the book and he said, it's like Mal's Red Book. And I was like, man, that's what I was thinking. And it was just really cool to hear him make that connection. I was like, how about you buy like 10 to 15 of these books and you all have like a youth organizing group where you talk about it and you really try to engage this. We need to build off of this. We actually do have an ideological frame. Um, myself and Alicia in particular, we are trained Marxists. I do believe in Marxism. It's a philosophy that I learned really early on in my organizing career. Investigations into the Black Lives Matter organization has revealed links to groups that are pro-communist China. The self-proclaimed Marxist Black Lives Matter co-founder Alicia Garza also owns the Black Futures Lab project. Yet, all would be lost for the Black Future Lab if not for the Chinese Progressive Association. Donations to the Black Futures Lab don't go directly to the foundation itself. The Chinese Progressive Association gets them instead. Through forensic investigations, we now know that the 2020 BLM, fiery but mostly peaceful protests, were organized and partially funded through a network of pro-communist organizations. One of the groups is U.S.-based Liberation Road, which was founded by a faction of the Communist Party of Vietnam. Liberation Road is allied with the new communist movement and has direct ties to the Chinese Communist Party. The San Francisco-based, communist-rooted Chinese Progressive Association formed a sister company called Asians for Black Lives to serve as a bridge between BLM and the Chinese Communist Party. I spent a lot of time with President Xi. He's deadly earnest about becoming the most significant consequential nation in the world. When we speak of China, it's important to distinguish between the people and their oppressive government. And while the Communist Party of China is undoubtedly America's greatest foreign adversary, it's crucial to recognize that the most urgent threat to the future of the United States resides within its own borders. We're so used to thinking in terms of the old-fashioned concepts of warfare, we fail to realize that the favorite weapons of communist conquest are instead propaganda. Do you know who the greatest propagator of disinformation in the history of the world is? The U.S. government. A slanted view of history. History has been written to tell us a certain story. The 1619 Project is trying to reframe that story. What these people are doing is subverting young black minds to think that the Revolutionary War was fought in order to preserve slavery. And it's based on something that simply isn't true. The tactics of internal subversion. I thought that America was racist. I thought it was patriarchal. I thought our capitalist society was just a means of exploiting people. And I thought all these things because that is what I was told. The preaching of hatred to incite civil disorder. I want to tell you, Kavanaugh, you have released the whirlwind and you will pay the price. A California man is facing federal charges for the attempted murder of Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Treason, blackmail, the smear. This is the first time Assange is being questioned over the rape allegations. The LA Times ran an article calling Larry Elder a black white supremacist all committed by soldiers who wear no uniform and who claim to be loyal citizens of the target country marked for conquest from within world war three that rages around us right now is a political war an economic war a psychological war a spiritual war as a matter of fact the bomb as a psychological weapon is being dropped on the american people every single day you probably assume you're safe. That could be a deadly mistake. Racing for food shortages. And labor shortages. Shipping delays. Supply chain disruption. A new coronavirus variant. The worst virus variant. Ultra transmissible. It can kill you. It can kill you. A surge in crime. A surge in crime. Acts of terrorism. Domestic terrorism. White terrorism. White supremacy. Mass shootings. Mass shootings. And nuclear, nuclear conflict. conflict. World War III. World War III. Vladimir Putin. Russia. 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 Environmental doom. Fire. Storms. And deadly floods. I don't want you to be hopeful. Science tells us we have nine years.
This storm will kill you. I want you to panic. It is promoting fear. It will kill your children. Feelings of fear. It will kill your pets. The world is a very terrifying place. Unless you get lucky. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day. Walk me through, if you would, what happens scientifically inside our minds when we're in a state of fear, and then how that affects our external choices and the direction of our lives. This is well known and well researched in the psychological literature and the psychiatric literature, that when someone is afraid, when someone is in a state of fear, that person cannot think rationally. You resort back to a more primitive way of making decisions, which is highly emotionally driven. And when you're placed in a chronic state of fear, as we have been, you end up in a, what I would call a traumatized state, meaning that you're not just momentarily scared, you are frozen. You have seen your ability to think critically suspended. The issue is not about COVID or vaccines or anything else. It's not that. That is the polarizing impulse that gives rise to our general sense of ill at ease which then amplifies our willingness to fall for reflexive classifications like race or you know, the isms that we wanna fight about. The more we can distract people by creating the illusion that says everything is fearful, the more we can manipulate the population. We were groomed for decades to be fearful, whether it was drop and cover. We must be ready all the time if the atomic bomb explodes. Duck and cover to protect against the threat of nuclear annihilation, or more recently, the impending ecological collapse of our planet in 12 years that AOC and Greta Thunberg keep warning us about. The world is gonna end in 12 years if we don't address climate change. How dare you? All of these fears are grounded to some degree in reality. They're not completely invented, but they are exaggerated so greatly that we cannot actually reason through them anymore. When people are afraid, they won't just accept authoritarianism, they'll demand it. They will demand it. Somebody do something. Somebody take charge and tell me what to do. Like, where do I stand? Where do I walk? What do we do? What are the rules? And again, people in power always use that, right? Where they say, never let a good crisis go to waste. We can take this and we can now enact policies that normally we wouldn't be able to get away with. Maybe in a couple of decades when people look back, the thing they will remember from the COVID crisis, this was the moment that we agreed to be surveyed all the time. And maybe even after the event is over, maybe we can still keep 30%. And over time, multiple crises, oh, suddenly you have a government or an individual who has far more power than they're actually supposed to. The leaders of the mass, the people who pronounce a narrative in public space, usually, or hypnotized themselves, they believe they need to reshape society to be able to deal with the challenges society faces and they believe so fanatically in that ideology that they think it's justified to manipulate and cheat and to use all kinds of narratives to convince people to go along with that ideology. We're going to go visit mom. I'm going to bring the home family to see mom. Uh, no. We will shut you down. We will cite you. And if we need to, we will arrest you and we will take you to jail. You either get your tests done and make sure you're cleared, or we will keep you in a facility longer. It's going to be very hard for people to do a lot of normal life unless they can prove their vaccination status. Such as, you're not going to work in this particular agency or institution. You're not going to be able to go to this college or this university. Once we start doing that, you will see more and more people willingly get vaccinated. If the fear of losing your job, your friends, family, and future isn't enough to coerce you into submission, perhaps these incentives will entice you to willingly comply. It's everything from cash prizes to college scholarships. Now offering kids 12 and up limited edition Avengers comic books. Thousands of prizes available. Including cruises and Super Bowl tickets. They're giving away Ford F-150 trucks. They're giving away shotguns and hunting rifles. Marijuana dispensaries are giving away joints for jazz. Krispy Kreme announcing this week a free donut. And yes, free beers. That's right. Get a shot and have a beer. Today could be your lucky day. California's vaccine lottery. One grand winner to take home up to five. 
five million dollars if you get vaccinated next week. They made it exciting, right? There's a reason people go to Vegas. It really could be somewhat lucrative if they aren't already persuaded. 13-year-old Joshua says one of the best parts of getting a shot at Mickey D's, lunch on the house. Just think of this when you think of vaccination. Mmm. If you need luck with love, dating apps are offering incentives too. The Vienna brothel is providing COVID-19 vaccinations and giving those who take up the offer a 30-minute session with a, quote, lady of their choice. We have finally found the one thing that makes us all more attractive, a vaccination. To love one another, as Jesus said, get vaccinated, get boosted. Do you think that it's being posed as politics, but it's behaving like a religion? Because it's acting like a religion. Yeah. It's the dogmatic. It's yeah. absolute. It's if you do not believe in it, you yeah. are condemned to hell. Maybe this is a new religion. God did answer our prayers. He made the smartest men and women, the scientists, the doctors, the researchers. He made them come up with a vaccine. That is from God to us. And we must say thank you, God. Thank you. There was a time, and not too long ago, I think, when we could have pulled ourselves out of this without too great a sacrifice on the part of anyone. But we didn't. Instead, we slept. Everywhere I look, I see men and women who know that communists are making headway in this country. They know that something must be done and that someone must stand up to them. But they themselves do nothing. They remain silent because they're afraid that if they speak out, it'll be bad for business. They may lose a client. They may even lose their jobs. Or perhaps they're receiving a regular government check and already are too dependent upon some of the very people and programs they know they should oppose. We have now passed the point of painless solutions and parlor patriotism. Well, all right, so what do we do about it? What are the countermeasures that need to be taken? And where do we begin? Before we finally win this battle, and I should hasten to say that there's no doubt in my mind that we're going to win. I'm increasingly convinced of this. But before we finally do see victory, we must carry the truth to every man, woman, and child in America. I have no idea of what each of you is going to do in the critical days that lie ahead. It may be much, it may be little, it may be nothing at all, I don't know. Only you can answer that question. But ladies and gentlemen, whatever it is you decide to do for your country, do it soon. Do it now. Every minute that you delay further will add dearly to, to the, the price, price of ultimate victory. Mr. Griffin, that was over 50 years ago. Where are we now? Hearing that phrase after all these years is kind of a shocker because I didn't realize really at the time how accurate it was going to be. But we're in the middle of it now. And so the ultimate victory is still ahead of us. How did you know way back then what would be happening today? Uh, it's a long story, of course, but I, I did take a fascinating tour of uh, the communist bookstore in Los Angeles when I was very, very young. I was working for an insurance company. I was Mr. Corporate America, you know. That was the period when the, the hippie you know, image was pretty popular, and a lot of these guys in that bookstore were in that uniform. And I think they felt I was a potential recruit, you know. Yes, we've always been quite willing to talk I about We'll talk about socialism anywhere, in the streets, or in the uh, Senate, anywhere, you know. Is there a communist faction making a big power play for SDS? Is there any communists back here? 
I guess there is. Yes, they are communists. And yet our nation seems unconcerned. Many newspapers, television commentators, and educators call these young revolutionaries dissidents. But are these voices voices of mere dissent, of mere student unrest, or of sedition and revolution? They invited me to come to their study groups, they called them. They were really the recruiting funnel, you know. And uh, I didn't have to pretend to be interested because I was interested. I wanted to see what these guys were up to. In the course, the more I read, the more I realized that these guys were deadly serious. And so my crusader gene said, hey, buddy, you better stop worrying about the corporate ladder and making money and looking good and start doing something about it. And I'm glad I did, uh, because after that point, my life had a meaning and had, had a purpose more than just self-centered. Who are some of the key figures behind this agenda? I'm not sure we can name names. We know that there are layers and layers of control and influence, sort of pyramidal in form. At the bottom level, of course, it's just all the common people. Most of them don't even know what's going on. It used to be that an invader could come in with a superior army, and people resent it, but they obey because if they don't, they get killed. Now, if they want to conquer people in this environment, they have to do it through the mind. And of course, today, after all the technology that we have, and the control over the communications and the images and the school system and the media, they have absolute control over the funnel of information that comes to the average person. And the average person, if they're not aware that there's a real war going on for their mind, they will be helpless. And as long as people are on the edge of fear, they're willing to give up their liberties and pay lots and lots in taxes. A tax on carbon. And as I passed through that idea that, in my view, the enemy is in a category called collectivism, and that's the word that applies to all of these things, socialism, communism, fascism, Nazism, all of these things are merely variants of collectivism. That is the philosophy based on the assumption that the group is more important than the individual and that the individual must be sacrificed if necessary for the greater good of the greater number. That's the trick. They say, you're doing this for society. Obviously, you don't like to tell people what to do, but sometimes for the good of society, that's necessary. We have to start doing things for the greater good of society and not for idiots who think that they can do their own research. But it's not about me and my rights to choose. It's about how I love my neighbor. You are not doing this for yourself. If you are at all like me, your own health, your own risk, is not a big rational driver of all of your actions. They trick us into thinking that if you act in your own self-interest, that somehow you are selfish, and nothing could be further from the truth. Those of us who've discovered this trick long ago, we realize that enlightened self-interest comes into play. If you are acting out of self-interest, you soon discover that the best way to benefit yourself is to help other people. It does come back. The question is, how do we turn the ship around? I think that the path to political hell in America has been voting for the lesser of two evils. They create conflict because the conflict creates fear and confusion, and out of that chaos, people are not too analytical. They'll just struggle for some quick answer, which is, who are you gonna vote for? That's usually the answer that's offered to them. They think that if you just vote for somebody, the, the right person, everything will go away. You cannot wait until there's a list of candidates that's published, and you say, hmm, which one am I gonna choose? You know, By that time, the game is over. All those candidates have been selected before you were even aware. You've got to get into politics at the local level so you have some influence in which candidates are selected. And that starts at the grassroots level. You don't come in at the top, you come in at the bottom. If we do that job, we will influence both political parties just like our opponents do now. There is actually a way forward and a way out, uh, but it's gonna require work, and it's also gonna require that we acknowledge that we have wronged ourselves that we are part of this problem. It's not the government that caused this. The government facilitated it. What caused it was our being asleep at the wheel. Without taking accountability, we cannot move forward. The masses of humanity have been slapped awake uh, in a very short period of time. 
to where now it has created a domino effect of awareness all across the planet. People cannot go back into the matrix now. They can't. A lot of people are trying to, and they can't. We have the right as citizens in this country to abolish a government and create a new one. And that is the authority that has been given to us. It is written in our documents, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of the United States, the Declaration of Human Rights. We have indelible rights, and the basis of those rights are our freedoms. And if we don't have that, we don't have life. And so we have to awaken, we have to arise, we have to fight. The natural rights of every individual is life, liberty, and property. And establishing a country on a premise that had never been established before, that the individual is sovereign because their rights are endowed to them by a sovereign God. This which has happened can only be described as divine, which is why we're the nation. Our ideology, our way of life is always under this relentless attack that we have defeated over and over again, and we will defeat it this time. We're all fighting with each other, and the way that we combat that is doing the opposite of what these war overlords want us to do, which is fight with each other. We should be uh, learning how to forgive and, and inviting other people to the table, even if we disagree with them, and um, extending grace to one another, even if we uh, know that they've done something that we totally disagree with. Because um, that's how we ultimately are going to heal as a nation, is understanding that we all come from different walks of life, and we all live here together. And let's, let's, let's start talking. The only real problem that's existed in the world, it's division. It's that people are not getting in rooms, willing to speak with one another, see each other's hearts, and get to know, hey, what do you believe? What do I believe? And is there a way we can actually work together to solve these problems? And I'm willing to bet that most of the Gen Zers would say yes. That's what we do right now, and that's why I'm glad we're the age that we are, because we can be leaders of that conversation. Mm -hmm. When I started to realize, like, wow, freedom's a polarizing concept for some reason, Thought this was America. Is this America? It is? Okay. World's different than I thought. So my fear was I'm gonna I could lose everything. I could lose my audience. I could lose my business. But I knew, especially having a son come into the world, I am imprinting something on his beautiful, innocent, fragile psyche and heart. I'm imprinting the man that I am, or I'm imprinting a hollow shell of the man that I refuse to be. And I knew in that moment, I'm willing to risk losing everything to do that. I would rather pick up cans on the side of the highway to feed my family than to live out of alignment with my truth and betray my son. Just say no. Rise up in a nonviolent way. They can't imprison everyone. They can't fire everyone. But they can fire individuals that are separated and don't work together and give in to the fear. And don't sacrifice your future for a few conveniences now in the present. You should sacrifice maybe the present conveniences so that you're gonna have a future. The media has done a good job at uh, stripping from us our ability to think on our own and for ourselves. If we can get back to that, I think that we can build a stronger America. In my opinion, the first step you have to take is you have to get out from under the control mechanisms. And that means blow up your TV, don't listen to the fear porn, um, and set yourself free of debt, which is what controls you and controls everything around you. It is the weapon that is used. The most important thing is always that the dissonant voices continue to speak out and, also extremely important, that they don't start to form a mass or a crowd themselves. Because that happens very easily as well, it happens very easily. Once a large scale mass formation starts, the people who do not go along with them feel threatened and they can start to form a mass themselves. So it's extremely important not to form a mass ourselves. That means to form a group, a coherent group, and that what unifies this group should in the first place be the fact that everybody who belongs to the, to the group can have his own opinion and can speak in his own way. What matters most to you? <sighs> I 
think what matters most to me is freedom. Freedom. I want as little laws as necessary to keep us from killing each other. I mean, I get it. There's crazy people out there. We have to find a balance. In the end, I want my children to live in a world where they're free, to dream, to take risks, to fail, to succeed. Hardship strengthens us. We wouldn't have had the American Revolution and the beta model for the American Constitution, the beta model of a republic in the modern world, unless the tyranny of King George had been unbearable. All the good things in life usually are a result of some kind of a rebound against something that's very not good at all, very painful. I mean, I think about if someone had jumped in there and taken away my failures. I can't do what I'm doing now if someone had kept me from really hurting, really learning lessons that were hard to learn so that I would never make that mistake again. In a philosophical sense, we should be thankful for this movement that's happening is in spite of the fact that it's it's tragedy and it's hurting people and all that but without it we might just go right along in that pot and be boiled in time but now the frog is jumping out and we have a chance coming up here now to create a new vision and it's going to be great it's a bit cynical but it is in the end good news that mass formation and totalitarianism always destroys itself in a relatively short time span and the most important thing, of course, is that uh, you have to make sure that the system does not destroy you before it destroys itself. Throughout history, it was always the very small minority. History has always been written by the 1% of the population. 15% of the population create history, and they follow the leadership, the thought leadership of 1%. But that 15% altogether is what changes history. And so all we have to do is reach 15% of the population. I think today, after all this time, we have more than 15%. We just have to get them together so they realize that they're not alone. And that's our task right now. I don't think our societies have taken the moment to um, look up and actually see and appreciate how much progress has been made in the past century. On so many different levels, we have made incredible progress, like what we've got here is actually great. It's imperfect, and we should still be making tweaks carefully to try to make it better. And I think that's where so much of that self-hatred or hatred of the nation or hatred of the other or whatever comes from, this lack of perspective and gratitude and inability to take a moment, chill out on the activism and go, wait, actually, okay, we, we've achieved a very unique and special point in history and let's be, let's be careful with that. On that note, as sure. a man who's traveled the world, yeah. have you experienced any nation that has course corrected beyond their sins more than the U.S. has? Uh, no. It's a sad to see Americans who live in a free country born as Americans and do not recognize their privileges. You are born American, a free country. You never suffered a starvation and you need to go to other countries to find out why all the immigrants, millions, millions of them, want to come here. What is happening in our backyard today, I experienced as an 11-year-old. I remember vividly all the promises that a guy named Castro gave on how 99% of the people swallow the pill. He was gonna save Cuba. I remember how he promised to the farmers, to the Guajiros, that you're gonna own the land. I remember all the promises that we hear today about free education and free health care and free land. And my God, no freedom. The defectors here that are speaking out against the Communist Party in China are risking their lives. And uh, 
Our government is not interested in listening to them or helping them in any way. I have been in America for 10 years. I saw a lot of Americans with a wonderful heart. America is a beacon of freedom. I'm happy living in this land to practice my religion and to have a peaceful life. That's my hope. America is last stand on earth for freedom. If we lose this country, the world will be a very dark place. I have three children in this country. I want to protect their American dream. So here I am, you know. I've noticed that every time you speak about America, your eyes fill with tears. I do, I do love this country. No place to go. And I just hope people can hear my stories. For past five years, I've been telling the same thing. I have no political agenda here. I just want to live American dream. I my children live American dream. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> It's time to ask questions. It's time to wake up. We've been brought together in this moment to face the urgent choice between dehumanization and rehumanization. Dehumanization requires us to do nothing nothing other than to allow that process to continue to the point of no return. Rehumanization, on the other hand, requires action. One action. To remember. To remember what we knew as children, when everything was possible, before our attention was captured, before the conditioning set in, before our nature was denied. There's nothing new we have to learn. All we have to do is to remember. And then take the hand of that memory and go out and stand on ground, not concrete, not asphalt. Stand on ground and see if you can feel the heartbeat of a universe that conspired to give you life so you once again can feel the joy of being completely human. And then never forget that moment. This is the moment for us to activate our innate ability to create solutions. That can only happen through the awareness of symbiosis defined as a mutually beneficial relationship between different groups. All of life depends on relationships. Every living thing is in communication. From the stars to the planets, the earth, the plants, the elements, the insects, the animals, the humans, and every cell within us. Real change out there begins with real change inside. As Americans today, we are truly a privileged people in a privileged land. But with our blessings come responsibilities, and with responsibilities come risks. The challenge of our time is that we must accept both the responsibilities of our blessings and the risks involved in defending them for ourselves and for future generations. And we must do this without hesitation if we are to be worthy benefactors of that precious heritage of freedom passed on to us through the epic sacrifices of those who have gone before. Now that is not flag-waving, and it is not cliched patriotism. 
as a simple statement of the obligations of citizenship in this glorious land, our land, which with God's help, we shall preserve.